Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron, I hope you're having a great day or night in Jesus. I'm so thankful you're here with us. We're looking at sociology and scripture, sociology in the Bible, sociology in Christianity, secular sociology versus biblical sociology versus various modes of biblical sociology and various modes of secular sociology group dynamics. So we're so thankful that you're here with us. We're looking today at critical theory. Now I know critical theory gets a bad rap sometimes. People say if you even mention the word critical theory that it's some um, whatever, I don't even know the phraseologies anymore, but it really is something that has been in use for uh, many decades. And it is a theological presupposition that you can look at structures of power and then begin to criticize them. This does go back into like Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals, but it also goes into like the Frankfurt School, the Vienna Circle in some ways, even the word sarcasm, you know, to rip the flesh. You could probably trace it back for sure to Francois Marie Arrette, whom we know most popularly as Voltaire in the uh, 1700s uh, with Candide and uh, you know the use of sarcasm to destroy, to take down. And they did. They tore down French society, the monarchy and religion and morals while they were at it and rebuilt it for Napoleon. <laughs> you know, and the Bourbons eventually came back in. Uh, with the Congress of Vienna and all this. So, um, critical theory is attacking uh, structural norms. And this is the reason in philosophy a lot of times people will say one of the stages that the modern world has so rapidly gone through. I mean, we were an agrarian society for almost 6,000 years, an industrial age, then, uh, you know, the modern age, then. Uh, the atomic age, nuclear age, you hear about the nuclear family after World War II, and then the postmodernism, and then um, you get into uh, you know structuralism and then post-structuralism, that the norms begin to fall. This is all has to do, Foucault and Derrida, uh, with critical theory, being critical of norms. So conservatism would want to conserve certain things, you know, some things that don't need to be conserved, you know, what I'm saying, like uh, persecution of people based on their skin color or marginalization of people because of that doesn't need to be preserved, obviously. But saying, you know, family, Bible, scripture, love, morality, helping one another, doing to others as you'd have them do unto you. Uh, even Jefferson and these types would see that needs to be preserved, John Adams. And, uh, and that's where conservatism would come in. So critical theory usually uses either A, the Hegelian dialectic, which you got a video or two on that, or exceptions. Now it uses many other things too, such as ridicule and sarcasm, but uh, it points out follies in the modern world and exceptions. Well, what about ism, as it's called? Well, what about this? What about that? Are you saying this? And so through a series of critical assumptions, you uh, go from the good to the bad. People begin to call good evil and evil good, light, darkness, darkness, light. I'll use an example of the Bible in textual criticism. And Theodore Lettuce has written a great book on this. I can't remember the name. I like almost everything Theodore Lettuce has written, but I can't remember the specific one where he goes through a history of this. So, you know, for hundreds of years, Protestants, Reformers, they all believed the Bible had been preserved, not just in the original autographs, but in accurate copies of the original autographs and even accurate translations of the original autographs. And so then the Princeton School, Warfield, and maybe some others, uh, went to Germany, studied, and they got little seeds of humanism while they were there. Uh, because Germany, going back to the Thirty Years' War, became a very secular society in a lot of ways. And because religion was fighting both sides, and, and he just became ingrained in them, be kind of somewhat secular, have a structure of religion, form of godliness. So that's just the original autograph. So what you hold in your hand is not perfect. And so then you have to 
begin to try to reconstruct that, which is perfect. At the same time, textual criticism, critical theory comes in. You can do this with a criticism of the family. Marxism uses this tremendously to destroy the family, to put up the 10 planks of Marxism and this type thing. And to say, um, well, there's 31,102 verses in the Bible. Uh, how many of those verses, how many of those words, 789,000 plus words in English, there's a different amount in Greek and Hebrew, obviously, which I've got videos on Bible statistics showing how many Greek and Hebrew words are in the Bible. Um, that, how many of these words are disputed, incorrect, uncertain, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, the Masoretes, the three series of scribes that predated the Masoretes, what were what was in the Kier and the Ketiv, that which is spoken, that which is written, you know, and uh, what is it? And so by the time you get through with it, it's just, everybody just does what they want. People have doctrines, they go in it with a Cornelius Vantilian presuppositionalism, and they say, this is what I want the Bible to say. And so I will twist any translation of any Greek word and Hebrew word to say that couldn't be what it means because I have a doctrine and I want the Bible to say this. And so people are no longer exegeting scripture. What does the Bible say to me? They're exegeting, eisegeting scripture. They're saying this is what the Bible says. And so whenever I find something disagrees with my doctrine, I say it should be translated. Greek word should be this. Hebrew word should be this. Or a textual tradition should be this. Or Codex Bezaeth does say this. Or the Oxy, Oxyrhynchus Papyrus does say this. Or the Ephraimi Rescriptus does say this. Or some new thing does say this. So you can see how critical theory goes from perfect using a little leaven, leavens a whole lot, to imperfect. And then everybody just says, well, let's just soothe our conscience, and everybody just does pretty good. And then you realize you don't have a definition of the good, and Nietzsche saw this almost perfectly in the 1870s and 80s, spent the last 18 years or so in an insane asylum, because many people think he was just making a, a political statement doing that, saying, others say he just had syphilis in the brain, that this is craziness because you have whence absolutes. Is it the will to power? Is it the uh, Uberschmann? Is it Hitler? Is it Trotsky? Is it uh, the audacity of Lenin? That was one of his big words was audacity. When people think we'll stop, we just keep going. I don't know. And so critical theory. So you're like, well, what does it have to do with sociology? Well, everything because is there a natural law? Is there something that is inherent being relatively good in most everybody? We know there's been child sacrifice in many cultures throughout history and probably even today, unfortunately, in all this. There's been slavery in, in many, many cultures, not just the United States of America, around the world, probably still even to this day. On and on. So what is the good? Who defines what is good? And this critical theory just ends you like the Lord of the Flies of Golding. A lot there. Hey, God bless. Thanks for being here. Share on social media. And uh, we'll talk with you later. Bye-bye.